Hello everybody, it's Michael Hollands once again for Sound of the Movies. Today I have the pleasure to be joined by Trevor Rabin. For decades, Trevor Rabin has been one of the world's most versatile and best musicians. On this episode, we will focus on his early days performing with very successful bands such as Rabbit and Yes. Furthermore, we will cover his solo albums and of course his marvelous work as a film composer. It is my pleasure to welcome Trevor Rabin. Hi, Michael. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine. How about you? Just great. Just great. Great. And thank you so very much for taking the time out of your schedule to um, to talk to me today. It is a, a pleasure. Trevor, at first, I would like to know a little bit more about your background. Um, as I understand, you were given piano lessons um, at a very early age and you continued with the lessons for many years and eventually you started to teach yourself how to play the guitar and subsequently um, you became a session musician at the age of 16 if i re remember correctly and could you please tell me a bit about those early days and how you evolved as a musician well that's the only thing you didn't add which uh, i can add is i was six years old when i started but outside of that you got everything and uh, um uh, yeah, I, I studied piano for quite some time. I got up to playing Chopin, which is not an easy thing. So uh, that was where I thought, okay, I've arrived. And uh, I was 15 at the time. Um, but what I did with guitar when I uh, decided I wanted to start playing guitar, I think I was 11. And uh, how I taught myself was uh, I used to, I, I would take piano my piano exercise book and uh i would practice my scales and things and exercises from these piano books so i kind of had a very different introduction to the guitar because of my training on it um learning from you know from a piano perspective but uh soon i it, it, very soon it became you know like i was in the saddle and i became more comfortable with the guitar than the piano Let's talk a little bit about the early days and the band experience which you had. Uh, if I remember correctly, you were one of the first members of the band Rabbits, um, which is still the most successful band ever to come out of uh, South Africa. Please tell me a bit about those days and how you and the group came together. Yeah, we were um, Neil Cloud, the drummer, and Ronnie Robot, the bass player. We were friends for a long, long time. And uh, in South Africa at the time, you had to go to the army. So uh, Ronnie and myself had gone to the army. And so we kind of split up for that year or so while we were in the army. Um, but we were playing before that, doing weddings and, you know, just social events. And, and that was at like 13, 14 years old. And then after the army, um, I'd been doing a lot of session work. But after the army, we got back together and started doing the circuit, playing all the clubs, and eventually the band started having, you know, people around the block trying to get into to the club, and we were the net, there, a place called Take It Easy. We were there for nine months, and the band got a really nice following. And because of my contacts with, uh, you know, with, a, with a, a recording studios and recording companies uh, doing session work, I... Um, I managed to uh, become friendly with a lot of people and uh, cut a long story short, uh, Rabbit got signed to do to do the record. And it was the first time a band had made a original music rock album um, in South Africa. So it was pretty kind of new territory on all on all levels. But, you know, the band was really good. And the um, the songs uh, seemed to catch the eye of a lot of people. It was a big hit, and the record company did a fantastic job. And uh, it's funny because this, the real success of the band with platinum albums and you know um, tours where we could, literally couldn't go out the, the hotel without bodyguards. It was just crazy. That was only for three years, and people thought, well, the short-lived uh, phenomenon called Rabbit. But in fact, we'd been playing together since we were ch uh, childhood friends. After the army, we we I had produced um, a, a guy called Duncan Fora, just a single he had, and it didn't uh, actually catch. And um, 
soon after then we thought it would be nice to have a keyboard player in the band and uh, a second singer and so we got him in the band and and, and that's how it really began and and uh, how we we went on fantastic thank you very much for elaborating on that uh, trevor and soon after that you would also intensify your band and gig experience when you joined yes which i believe was in 1983 if i'm not mistaken yes was <clears throat> a massively popular band and i think you had produced four albums with them and to the best of my knowledge the album 90125 remains the band's biggest selling album actually and is it correct that it was entirely based on your demos yeah the in fact the demos um i had written i wanted to do a solo album and i'll try and make this as short and unboring as possible but <laughs> i was um signed by i was living in london and i'd been picking a lot on on my third solo album i had jack bruce playing bass and a man for man on keyboards and It was a real fun experience, and uh, so I had uh, I signed to Geffen Records, and they wanted me to come over and work with people and put a band together. And I wanted to do it as a solo album, so it didn't work out with Geffen. So after being here for six months on Geffen Records, they uh, they dropped me from the label, and I had all this material ready to go to make an album. And so I sent tapes around, and the first guy to get it was a guy, Ron, Ron Fair, who was famous for Christina Aguilera and uh, has become, and, um, and Black Eyed Peas. But at the time, he was uh, just a junior A&R guy at RCA Records. And uh, he heard my demos, and the first thing he did, he called me and he said, you've got a number one hit on this album called Own of a Lonely Heart. And I said, oh, wow, that's, uh, that's, that's the first song on, on my tape. And he said, yes. And he said, I want to sign you. And I nearly signed, I really, really liked Ron and nearly signed with RCA. But around the same time, other, the tape had gone out to other people. And I got a, a call from Atlantic Records and they knew I'd worked with Jack Bruce. So they suggested why don't you, Jack Bruce, and Keith Emerson put a band together? And uh, we also have another idea, uh, get together with Chris Squire and Alan White. And it just so happens that um, they set up meetings, and the first meeting was with Chris and Alan. And uh, we got together and we played for a while. It sounded terrible, but we knew it felt good. And that's how it started. And we just... From then onwards, we uh, started, you know, getting to know the material from these, you know, from the demos, and uh, we went in and did the album. Yes, it's one of the most popular bands, and rightfully so. And I think you you really had something going back then. And there's a lot of lot of music history there, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I really enjoy the music. Um, I enjoyed it back then. Well not back then because I, I was <laughs> I was born in '85. I, I uh, kind of grew up with it with the um the rock and uh, rock and pop world and it's really fantastic oh well thank you so much you're the same age as my son he's a fantastic drummer he was with a band group love he played drums wrote for them and and produced them and was on the road with them for years and then decided he was really too much time has been taken up by touring so he uh, stepped away from touring with the band and uh, he became a producer and he's done very well he's producing guys like um, Keith Urban and uh, different kinds of things wow great well that's 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 quite an accomplishment so he basically also followed um, in your in your footsteps that's a great thing it turned out great he's a better drummer than me but I'm a better guitarist than him Trevor now I would love to talk just a little bit about your um, solo albums you yes. you released your first solo album in 1977 and the last one came out in 2012 you had also done a live recording of Can't Look Away um, which was called Live in LA right and then a, yes. co a compilation album called 90124. Could you please tell me a bit about the history of these 
albums and the collaboration with uh, fellow musicians such as you know Manfred Mann, Mark Mancina, Kevin Kruger, Alan White, just to name a few. Um, with regard, the first album, I was still living in South Africa, and uh, Chrysalis signed me. And I had gone um, at the same time as they wanted to sign me. I'd moved to London, and I started a record company there called Blue Chip Music. And we, uh, it, you know, then it became, you know, I had beautiful offices in Golden Square. Some a company sponsored the whole thing, a, a milling company in South Africa. But then I realized. Uh, very soon that I wasn't made out to be an executive and running a record company and was taking so much of my time. So I just, uh, after, it did quite well, And uh, but after a couple of years, and I was producing at the same time, and I did an album, uh, one of the albums I did was an album called Wolf. That's where Manfred Mann came in, because I also produced an album of Manfred's, and he came in and reciprocated and played some fantastic keyboard solos on the album, and um, and Jack Bruce came in and played a lot of the bass on it, and Simon Phillips was on drums, and it, it was a great time. And then uh, many years later, because Yes started obviously taking a lot of time, I had no time for a solo album, I did Can't Look Away, which uh, was uh, I was Bob Evans was the producer and it's we had, we got on well and it was uh, I was proud of that album almost all of it not you can never be proud of a whole album I don't know anyone who can but and then you know yes happened and I'm just talking about these albums and so uh, Rob Ailing from um, the record company that releases some of my stuff said why don't we do an album of your demos. And I said, you know, they four track demos. They really, you know, the ideas are there, but the sound is not there because every song I write, I do um, so I can hear it properly. But then I know what to do when I go into the studio. Um, and then he convinced me and we released it. And it's, it's called 90124 because it's basically got the material uh, of mine that I did on 90125. So that was kind of a fun project. And then, you know, I was doing movies uh, I, after leaving Yes in 94, I think. Um, I started doing movies because I missed, you know, no one in the band read music. You know, rock and roll, very few people actually approach music from that point of view. And I was missing working with musicians where you write something out and you just play it immediately. You know, when people don't read, you've got to kind of sit and work it out. And it's not that anyone... I mean, Chris Squire couldn't read music, but he was one of the great bass players of all time. But uh, having done movies for a while and, you know, getting involved a lot with orchestra, which I loved, um, I thought mu I thought film would be a great way. But in the middle of all of this in the 2011, um, well, actually 2010, I started working on an instrumental record because I hadn't done one and uh, I really wanted to do an instrumental record and that was Jacaranda was the album and uh, it took a long time because I, it was, I, I would grab times in between doing films so it took quite a long time to do and, and uh, that was the one for, that came out in 2012. Before you did your last solo album you had been very busy scoring scoring movies and it all started in the mid 90s i believe in 96 when you scored a film called glimmer man correct correct if i am not mistaken you had been asked by steven seagal to give him a guitar lesson and then he actually asked you if he if you wanted to score glimmer man is that correct I remember I taught him to play Red House, the Hendrix Red House, and he was very excited afterwards. He he almost got it, but uh, he was very happy, and he said, oh, man, any time I can do anything for you, can I pay you? I said, don't be ridiculous. Uh, you know, that's silly. And um, he said, well, anything I can ever do for you. And I said, well, you know what? I've actually just left uh, the band and um, because I want to get into film scoring or uh, even just being a guest uh, conductor somewhere or just getting into that uh, uh, place. And I thought film work would be a good place. And that's not why I went to teach him. It was just by the way, because I hadn't really thought it through. And uh, 
he said, uh, I, so I said to him, uh, if you know of an agent that deals with film composers, I'd like to speak to someone. And he said, I'll give you one better than that. I've just finished a movie which is going to be a big, uh, big release um, in America and around the world. Um, and you can do the score. And I said, but you don't know if I can do the score. He said, yeah, I do. You can do the score. So I had a meeting. Doug Frank was the head of music at Warner Brothers. And uh, he had a meeting. I'll never forget. We went to a restaurant and he was very frank with me. He said, what makes you, what, why should I believe you can do a movie when you've never done one? And it's a big budget movie and a lot of responsibility. And uh, I was a little facetious. I said, um, well, what makes you think you can talk Steven Seagal out of it? Because I knew Steven kind of really ran the thing there. <laughs> and so I landed up doing the movie. And then later, uh, Doug and I became big, good friends. I went on to do many movies for him. But yes, that was my first movie. And uh, that was my way in. Great. That's that's actually quite a quite a story, which turned into a huge success story, actually, because subsequently <clears throat> you had written music for Con Air, which was a huge step up in terms of size and in terms of action. And you shared co-credit with uh, Mark Manchina. This was your first film for um, producer Jerry Bruckheimer. And as Jerry Bruckheimer is known to be very hands-on and also demanding, how did you and Mark deliver what this action film needed, which was directed by Simon West. Right. Well, uh, to start off with, uh, Mark Mancina years before, had I had called him because I heard there was a keyboard player he knew and I wanted him for my live, for, you know, the Live in LA album. I needed, I was doing a turn, I needed a keyboard player. And so I, I, he, I someone told me he, a friend of mine who owns a restaurant said, oh, there's this guy, Mark Mancina, who plays in our restaurant and uh, the guy in the band is the guy you're talking about. I don't have his number, but I've got Mark's number. Uh, so I called Mark and uh, I said, I'm looking for so-and-so's number. I need a keyboard player. And it was amazing. He just said, I'll do it. I, I said, what? And he said, I'm a keyboard player. I, I, I'll, do, I'll drop anything to do it. I really want to do it. So I thought, wow, he's a pushy guy. <laughs> And uh, but I liked that. And so he landed up being the keyboard player in my band. And then years later, when this all happened, Mark had been doing films and he had done Bad Boys for Jerry. And uh, Jerry had uh, uh, someone from Jerry's organization uh, had said they had gone to see Glimmer Man and that the music was good and I, he should check me out, uh, which led to me and Mark being asked to do Con Air. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, very soon into the beginning of the film, before much had been written at all, uh, Mark was had to go off to do Speed 2, I think it was. Yes. So I landed up pretty much, I landed up doing Con Air on my own, um, which put me right in, the, right in the deep water with Jerry, and uh, we got on great. He is very demanding and... He, he really demands a lot from you, but he's very fair. And I got a really good relationship with him and uh, did Con Air, and then it did really well. And then Armageddon came up, although I did a movie after that called Homegrown, which was a small-budget movie, which was fantastic. It's a nice movie with um, Billy Bob Thornton. Right, so he was, and it was a lovely movie. I did that, and then, and then uh, Armageddon was being started. So... I approached Jerry and I said, look, I'd love to do Armageddon. And uh, he said, look, this is a huge budget movie and uh, it's a lot of responsibility. You know, you're very new to this and I, I'm not sure that you can do it. And I said, well, look, let me read the script and, uh, and then let me write a theme for you. And he said, okay. He said, my problem is the script can't go out of here. It's very private and very secretive. Uh, no one can read it. So you're going to have to come into my personal office. Um, I'm going out for a meeting for a couple of hours. You're going to have to sit in my office and you're not allowed to even leave the office with, with the, and, and if you want to go to the bathroom, you put the script down. <laughs> it was that secretive. 
I read the script. I went back home. Um, he said he wants a theme. It must be the theme of the world, you know, like a, nan uh, a, a national anthem. This must be the world anthem. So I went and I wrote what then became, later became the theme of Armageddon. I, he heard it and he said, you got the movie. So that was how I started with Jerry. Right. And Armageddon, it's a huge movie, as you just mentioned, and big budget and lots of responsibility. On top of that, Jerry Bruckheimer was producing it. Gail and Hurt was in there and Michael Bay directed it. So that's quite a trio. And yes, yes, <laughs> it was quite a, quite a trip, quite a trip. I bet it was. And I know that Harry Craxon Williams, who is also a friend of yours, also um, wrote some music for, uh, for, for Armageddon uh, due to also the, the time constraints. What happened was I had be, I really had come to the point where uh, the first thing I did was write all the vital themes, the main themes. And then I started doing it. And um, Uh, on a lot of movies, you, you say, look, I've got this area, here's the music, here's the themes, I just need you to go and do that stuff in this part. And I had my assistant, Paul Linford, um, uh, do some cues, and I had Harry do some cues, and he got Jablonski. To, uh, he, I think he only did one cue, but it was really a, 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 you know, a pressure cooker. It was a very pressured... Um, but I really... Um, I, I love doing, uh, working in that environment. So um, it was, I, it's one of my proud moments, the music I wrote for, uh, for Armageddon. I must say, Armageddon to me personally is one of the best scores of the 90s. I think you, you wrote it when you were in Hans's, in Hans's complex, is that right? Or am I on the wrong track? You know, the funny thing is people do get, sometimes get uh, mistaken here because I had nothing to do with media ventures. I yes. knew Hans. I'd known Hans for years. I did Con Air, and then on, um, J Jerry said to me, you know, you, your studio is so far from my office. Could you do get a studio nearer to my office? And so I have rented a studio on Con Air to do uh, that, and... Um, Then when Armageddon started, that studio wasn't available. So I just called Hans. I said, do you have an available room? And he said, actually, we do have an available room. And that's how it was done there. But the project had nothing to do with Media Ventures. In fact, you know, that was just that was just a, a happy coincidence that they were there. But uh, the, the brunt of the project was definitely stuck on my lap with Jerry. And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Right, and I think it's a it's a fantastic fantastic score, and I am really I really love to listen to it and to to, to rewatch the movie. I basically watch it every year at least once. There are so many fond memories. And speaking of Jerry Bruckheimer, after you had done Armageddon, you were asked to um, join Harry, or you were asked by Jerry Bruckheimer, I bet, to um, write the score for the Enemy of the State. Yeah, well, Jerry called me and um, the director, Tony Scott, and they wanted me to do Enemy of the State. And while I was doing Enemy of the State, I was also on another film called Jack Frost. So I had two films going, and um, it was really going to be a big pressured thing. So I said to Jerry, look, I can do it, but I'd like to invite uh, Harry to do it with me. He, you know, I'll do the main themes and everything, but... It would be great if Harry's on the project. And um, so Harry was into it. Uh, it, it. It became really an enjoyable movie to do. And Harry did a great job to the point where I went to Jerry and I said, Harry should get enough front credit with me because he, he, did, he did a great job. And in fact, after that, um, Tony Scott, uh, I was unavailable for a couple of years after Enemy of the State and... Uh, Tony Scott uh, got on well with everyone to the point where he got Harry to do, I think, all his movies from them. Yeah, I'm, I'm still very friendly with Harry, and uh, uh, we, we go back a long ways. Trevor, now I would like to talk about Bad Boys 2. The second part was about, you know, 10 times bigger than the first one. Mark, Mark had written the first one, 
you scored the second one. They also asked Dr. Dre to add some hip hop, hip hop beats. What are your recollections of Bad Boys 2, if I may ask? You know, that was quite strange because they actually got Mark to do, Mike Mancina, to start um, to do Bad Boys 2. And for some reason, Michael Bay did not like what he was doing. Um, he actually said, you know, the music's making me feel sick. And I thought, my goodness, Mark's a good composer. I don't know what this is all about. And uh, he, I was called and they said, look, um, we want you to do Bad Boys too." And I said, well, no, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not getting in the way of uh, one of Mark's projects. And they said, no, he's been fired. We're not using it. So, and so I said, all right, I'll, I'll do it. But I'm not doing any themes that Mark did. I'm doing my own new themes. I'm not going to do the old themes. And they were, I think, desperate. And they said, OK, I must be honest. I listened to Mark's score. And I thought it was good. I thought it was fine. I didn't know what their problem was. But whatever it was, I redid the, the score. And um, um, uh, I got Paul Linford, my assistant, to he did some great cues on it. And um, and, and uh, Jablonski did cues on it for me. And, uh, yeah, that was a tough project. It, it was also very pressured. I also spoke to Mark Manchina um, about Bad Boys and about Michael Bay um, more than a year ago, and I loved his Bad Boys score. I think it's one of the best he's ever written, one of the best action scores. Absolutely. Of the, one of the best action scores of the 90s. And um, it's I agree. apparently there were some issues also on Bad Boys 1. Well, I must be quite honest with you that when before I started Armageddon, uh, my agent said to me, look, uh, you know how hard Jerry is to work with. With Michael on it, it's 10 times. And I said, okay, well, I'll go in knowing that. And uh, I remember the one incident I had with Michael right in the beginning. I came in and he shouted over. He was in my studio and there were a whole lot of people there. And he, he was eating a cream pie, I remember. And he said to me, hey, hey Trevor, I dreamt you wrote a good, a good cue. And that's how he gets to people. He tries to intimidate. But, you know, I'm new to the film business. So I'm not, I, it kind of brushes off me like it, of a duck's back. So I, just in a joke, I said, oh, I dreamt you made a good movie. <laughs> and uh, that kind of started us off on a much different kind of thing. And with all this stuff with Michael Bay, yes, he's very difficult. And But I got on really well with him. And I, I like Michael. I, I, I had no problem with Michael. Not on Armageddon, not on Bad Boys 2. At the end of the day, he's, you know, if you just recognize he's got a vision and he wants to get there and nothing must get in his way. He doesn't have a very good bad side manner, I would say, but uh, it never bothered me, never bothered me. Thank you very much for, for sharing this with me, Trevor. I really, um, really appreciate that. Uh, in some cases, producers are very hands-on, you know, like Jerry Bruckheimer. And when it comes to yes. music, When it comes to music, sometimes the director is the one calling the shots. I've heard sometimes the producer is the one who says, no, I would like to hire X, Y, Z, or that's the, that's not the way um, we should approach it. How have you experienced this? Yeah, you know, I, I think this is worth saying. Um, I had a weird introduction to film. I didn't go through the thing where I was the coffee boy and then you know, used to do the mail and then came up to do some programming and then did one cue on a movie. And I didn't have that. I went straight in, as I told you, with Steven Seagal. So I came in really quickly and I had a real hard, quick learning learning curve. And one of the things I figured out very early on is directors get very attached to the temp scores, I'm sure you know about. Yes. And what, and what, what happens with that is I thought, This is not good because I'm not here to write music to sound like the temp score. If that's what I have to do, I don't want to do this as a job. Um, and I would have stopped doing it straight away. Uh, so I thought, I've got to find a way to combat that. So my way, right from Armageddon, in fact, was, um, and which happens because of the circumstances, but it became my model of how to do a score. I would write um, the muse. I would write a whole load of themes once I got to know the script, and uh, I would put these themes together and do 
like an overture of all the themes working together. And I would present this to the director and I'd say, I want you to listen to this every day. And, and, and when I start the movie, I want you to know this music. And then you can tell me the parts you like and don't like. And by the time I started the movie, they were very familiar with the, with this stuff. It was different with Bad Boys because I had to get in straight away. It was an immediate thing. But all the movies where I had a little bit of time, I would write themes before even looking at picture, just with the, the vibe of the characters in the script. And so when they got to start the movie, even if there was a temp score they were really into, they were equally as familiar with the music which I intended to write on the film. So when I replaced, or I, I never listened to the temp, I'd never wanted to, I would never, and they'd always, often they'd say, just listen to the temp. I'd say, no, I don't want to do that. And, uh, but because they were familiar now with the music of mine, it was much easier. The familiarity wasn't a problem. And uh, it, it enabled me to attach the music to what was otherwise uh, you know, set in stone um, temp score, which I've mentioned this when I was uh, speaking at USC, and make sure that they're familiar with the music before they hear it on, on with the picture. If that's possible, you're in much better shape. And temp score, I know it drives many people absolutely nuts, but it's a common ingredient of any uh, composer producer or composer director uh, relationship But yes and it's become it's it's become more and more important in fact there was a film called um, i don't know adam sandler with burt reynolds um, about a prison team who play football against the police and um, it was it, it's been done years ago with burt reynolds and now adam sandler did the new one And they wanted me to do the movie, and I couldn't do it. I was busy with something else. And they got someone to do the movie, and they used my music as the temp. And it turned out, when the movie was finished, my agent called me, and Brockheimer called me and said, listen, they've used Remember the Titans and um, National Treasure. And it's just, it's all your scores in there. They've just copied it. And uh, I listened and I said, well, I understand what the guy went through. He was probably there writing great stuff. And they said, no, 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 we want this. And he just didn't stand a chance. And uh, Brockheimer got, uh, was very annoyed. And to cut a long story short, uh, I ended up owning the, the uh, copy, you know, the uh, music that this guy had written. And, uh, you know, he came to me and I, oh, God, I wish I could remember his name. Very good composer. And he said, please don't, you know, don't kill me. And I said, look, I understand what you went through. And you've obviously worked out what's going to happen where, I, you know, I'll end up owning the stuff. But um, I'm not going to ask for your fee or anything like that. Yes, absolutely. And it also, it, um, it doesn't really promote creativity when, when you're asked to just rip off somebody else. But that's a whole different, a whole different story. I mean, I can understand if somebody says, well, That's the kind of mood we want. That's the kind of vibe we want. But to simply ask or even said, demand that you or somebody else copy somebody else, that's just, you know, I don't know what to say. It's a gray area, also legally speaking. So, Well, it's just, you know, you don't get into this game to, into film scoring to, to try and copy someone. If, if, you, if that's why you're doing it, you shouldn't do it. I think... It's supposed to be something where you can add something, where you can take this film and and put your, you on it. You know, it's a it's a fantastic feeling when it works, and uh, it's really disappointing to think that people are being forced, you know, like they shackled to have to do that. It's it's very unfair and it's very un unfortunate because then the project is not really a, you know, it's it's just some kind of weird hybrid. The music, it's somebody yeah. else's music penned by somebody else it's yes. it's a real unfortunate thing yes absolutely i couldn't agree more one director i was going to ask you about is um joel schumacher i know mr schumacher passed away and you had worked with him on bad company 
which, which was also produced by yes. Jerry Bruckheimer once again. <laughs> right. And what are your recollections or your memories of Joel Schumacher and the whole collaboration, if I may ask? Um, well, I got on fantastically with Joel. He was a sweet, sweet old guy and just a, you know, just a lovely, gentle human being. Um, one thing I can tell you about doing that movie, one morning I was just getting into the studio and I was about to do a scene on the movie where they blow up um, a, a New York Central Station, a train station. And then the phone rang, and uh, so I answered the phone, and it was Jerry Brockheimer. And he said, uh, have you been watching the news? And I said, no, I'm in the studio. I'm about to do. He said, do not do that, Hugh. Stay away from anything like that. But that is out the movie. I'm not putting that in the movie. I went inside to look at the news and TV. It was 9-11. Because of that, that movie was changed it could have been a good movie it landed up not to be because it was so much about you know a terrorist uh, not necessarily the terrorists that um perpetrated 9-11 but uh it was you know it had that vibe in it and uh it really changed the movie and it was really unfortunate and un, you know a, a, a sad for what was going to be a good movie and You know, it, it, there was really a good vibe on that movie with Jerry and Joel, and we were all working really well together. I had a, I really enjoyed doing the score, but then it really took such a weird turn because of 9-11, and it, it, you know, it never quite uh, recovered from that. Trevor, as you scored so many pictures, also, you know, action-oriented pictures or thrillers, you know, you did Deep Blue Sea, The One National Treasure. You worked with John Turtletop a couple of times, Rennie Harlan, Peter Seagal. What is the secret and the essence behind a good collaboration for you personally? You know, it's first and foremost the trust. Um, the director has to get to trust you. And, um, and you know, I'm, I'm not difficult. If, if the director says, You know, I'm not sure that's working. A composer shouldn't look at that as he doesn't like my music. You know, the composer is the guy that gets to put the idea on the table. They don't write the music. I write the music. So I put it on the table. If they don't write it, write like it, they don't tell me what to do. They just say, try and go in this direction. And so I get to go onto a different platform and write music. And that's how it should be done. You should never acquiesce to the problem of I'm not getting it, let me listen to the temp and we bring up temp again but uh, I think that that's the important thing that you, you have to have the trust and you know, as the movies go by it's a kind of catch-22 because on your first couple of movies you don't have the reputation but once you get the reputation obviously the trust is easier but one of the problems with you know The, the action thing I got into, the you know, the big action score, um, I, there was a lot of trust for me to do that. But at one point, I wanted to do a comedy. And uh, it was very difficult to get because they thought, well, I don't know if you can do comedy. And then I did the Banger Sisters. And I remember going for a meeting because uh, Peter Siegel really wanted me to do um, Get Smart. And the, the, the producers were... I don't know. This is comedy. It's a whole different, you know, the rhythm, the timing. It's so different, uh, that kind of scoring. So I went in and uh, had a meeting with them. And they said, why should we believe that uh, you, you can do a comedy? And I said, well, I, I was in Yes for 15 years. How much more comedy do you need? Because it's a bit spinal tap, you know. And uh, I said some... One other joke I can't remember, and uh, somehow that led them to thinking, you know what, this guy's got a sense of humor. I think he's got a good idea of what it was. And also Mel Brooks was involved, obviously. And uh, so that led to me uh, getting the movie, and uh, it was easy with Peter Siegel. You know, I did, did that for him and then did one other movie for him. Um, Grudge match. And we just, I think, it was a grudge match, and... Uh, You know, that was a good idea that was actually not such a good idea, but 
we still did it and uh, <laughs> had fun with it. But uh, uh, Get Smart was uh, did quite well. But, you know, then I, I mean, one of the problems I've had in being able to do, you know, many, many uh, films with one director a lot, you know, uh, working constantly with one director is, you know, when you get booked for different movies, you uh, your availability becomes a problem. I've always struggled with that because sometimes I'd be on a movie and then I'd oh my God, I can't do that movie now. And I never wanted to be on a situation where I was doing two right at the same time again, which I did with Enemy of the State and Jack Frost. So um, I never took two on at the same time again. I mean, sometimes they overlap but uh, never directly at the same time. I wouldn't do that. Wise decision, probably. I think scoring one movie uh, full-time is tough enough as it is. Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost impossible. Um, besides the logistics of it, just the whiplash of you're in a set of creative thought on the one movie, and then you have to change to another movie and... You know, you couldn't have two different styles of music and movie than Jack Frost and Enemy of the State. So it was really, I had to really discipline myself to uh, yes. to involve myself on both sides. Yes, I, I bet. And, and Trevor, what strikes me about your um, music is your willingness to, to also switch gears. I mean, you had incorporated rock elements, guitar elements in scores like Gone in 60 Seconds. You wrote Remember the Titans, a more, um, let's say, heartfelt, emotional approach. You did Max, Coach Carter, Glory Road, and so many different, so many different um, pictures. How would you describe the um, development of the film business since you got involved in the 1990s until today vis-a-vis -vis studio demands and the art of scoring in general? Unfortunately, what I've got to say on that is not, uh, not very positive. I think um, it's such a changed business. You know, the, what's going to happen with theaters, Netflix is such a uh, huge thing now and things like that. And, uh, you know, just as far as the money people earn, uh, if you're a new composer, it's, you, you know, I mean, some people are doing things for nothing just so that their performance, you know, BMI or ASCAP or whatever it is, um, they're doing it for that. And uh, so it's really become, you know, it's become very difficult. And, you know, I was lucky I was, Uh, started off where music was so important for the film. The films, you know, would do. They still can do billions of dollars, but there's there's huge focus now on on the other side. You know, with uh, stuff you watch on like your computer or TV. Um, that the theater is almost an old fashioned thought, and you know, people are not paid as well as they sh uh, should be. Uh, especially new composers, and uh, are driven to do things. Uh, it's it's really a tough place to be. Uh, luckily for me, I happen to stand up on the most difficult kind of movies to do. So I uh, I can sympathize because I know what having that pressure is. But um, I just think it's it's changed so much now and. Uh, You know, music is uh, taken as the crumbs at the end of the project. You know, whatever what's left of the budget, we can use that there. Whereas with Brockheimer, music was... Uh, and, and all the other people I worked with, Rennie, who I've just worked with, uh, it's music is very important. So you feel like you really are part of the, part of the thing. You know, you, you're painting pictures for the film and uh, you're painting portraits for these different characters. I mean... A lot of film these days, it's, you ask to paint, but it's like painting a room. You have also worked on quite a few TV series, also miniseries. I mean, in 2013, you had done Zero Hour. And as of 2015, you had done 12 Monkeys, Agent X, and also Cine Shalom. Do you wish to um, expand on the TV assignments? I always kind of look at it a little organically. And if, uh, if I feel good with the director and he feels good with me and uh, I feel I can really add something um, 
that's where it all starts. But um, unfortunately, you know, zero hour, we had such a good time. I, I even convinced them to use real orchestra. I mean, it was really quite amazing. Every week we would have an orchestra session. So I would have to. So this is one of the bad things, you know, with with these kind of, you know, when you first hear about, OK, you're going to do a series. Um, you think, OK, well, I'll write the music for the first one. And then the music edi editor on the second one can just take the stuff and track it, you know, and make and I'll write a bit. And but really, uh, my experience with the TV stuff is always landed up writing every obviously themes and everything continue throughout. But I um, I really it was each each episode turned out to be like a mini movie for me. And with Zero Hour, I was really happy with that because they were um, they they were happy to uh, pay for a real orchestra. And then Terry Terry Metalis, who um, I did twelve monkeys with, and then I just couldn't continue because I was busy with other stuff. And um, but uh, I didn't leave because I wasn't enjoying it. I uh, really enjoyed working with him. I just had to stop. Agent X. Uh, yeah, I remember that. That just didn't work. I did I think ten episodes but i don't think they you know didn't get off the ground uh, sharon stone was in it and they had some good actors in it but um i thought it was pretty good but um it, but what happens you know it's funny like i did remember the titans and i'm very proud of that um um score i, I had such a great time with that it was it just kind of rolled you know it, it, there was no hiccups it just really happened I, I've even gone on, you know, Max is the one I, I did with the same director. And uh, the big thing with uh, Titans was Jerry and the director really had different opinions about the music. So I just kind of slid in the middle and did my own thing. And it turned out to um, please them both. And But what happens, it's like you talked about, you know, you do action movies and then you get known as, the, oh, you're the action guy. Uh, and I wanted to do all kinds of different things. I liked the idea of doing a Western and, uh, you know, a war movie, a sports movie. So I did remember the Titans and it did very well. And next thing I'm being asked to do a lot of sports movies. I even did the uh, uh, national basketball and the NBA. I did the theme for TN TNT for the, the NBA. It's been running for 16 years. And I, who would have thought I was going to be going to do that? You know, so... <laughs> Uh, so it's a good thing and it's a bad thing. You know, you get typecast. Yes, absolutely. I, I know what you mean. If we still have a couple of minutes left, I would like to ask sure. you which project you found the most fulfilling in terms of orchestral performance, in terms of your own writing, orchestrally or synthetically. What, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think my proudest moments and most enjoyable enjoyable moments uh, orchestrally and that's really where i i love i just it's just so exciting for me that if you know because with things like uh, con air it was very much a hybrid you know it's the a lot of rock or kind of almost punk at times elements and and the one was a very rock score but uh, things like the great raid which was for harvey weinstein yes. at the time um, I loved, uh, John Dahl was the director. I loved doing that movie because we went to London and worked with the orchestra there. And uh, it was a purely orchestral score. There was, I think, a couple of elements which I, I liked. I had a, uh, a Chinese guitar I played on one of the cues, but it was on top of an orchestra. So that was a fully orchestral score. And I loved doing The Great Raid. Uh, another one, well, Titans wa wa uh, was mostly orchestral, and I just loved that. So uh, those are the ones I really, really love. Uh, also, Flyboys, which was a movie that not a lot of people saw, but uh, yes. it was very enjoyable to do. Yeah, very, very good, very good score. I just listened to that a couple of days ago. Very good cues, and The Great Raid, another big, uh, very good example. And... Um, I also tremendously enjoyed, you know, National Treasure, especially the first one. It's a very nice, entertaining movie. You've got quite a lot to, to show for. I could tell you a funny story on National Treasure, the first one. I wrote the first theme, uh, the, fir the main theme, 
and I played it to, I was very excited. I was very happy with it. And I played it to Jerry and John and John looked at me and said, that sounds like a, sounds like a Western. <laughs> and I thought, oh, how do I combat this? Because it definitely doesn't, it could work in a Western, but it's not for the, it's for this movie. And I eventually I came up with an idea of look at Star Wars, listen to some of the music in there, which is, you know, the great John Williams. I guarantee you I could take some of that music and Tim score a Western with that music. I said, so just because something you think of that could work with a Western, um, you know, some Western music could work really with the sky fi or a, a war movie, you, you never know. It's it doesn't. Although obviously there's there's different degrees, and but luckily jo, uh, Brockheimer said, "You're crazy, John. This is to me. This is this spells national treasure. This is exactly the theme of the movie." And John was talked into it, and uh, um, afterwards John was uh, he always would say to me, "This is this is the best uh, the best theme." in this movie and i said you remember you said it was a western he said oh, i was completely wrong don't don't bring that up to me <laughs> he used to get kind of angry and and then the second one came along and uh you know i used those themes but uh one thing jerry's always good at he says i know we've got themes but i want you to look at it and i want you to come up with completely new themes and uh, i like that you know it was using the old themes, but also coming up with completely new themes. So you're not just relying on the old themes. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts on that. And Trevor, when will the new Rene Harlan movie be released, actually? You know, as I say, I started this movie, I, I signed on to it a week before we went into lockdown and I just finished. And um, I know they were, they were scheduled for the... Um, Uh, the Cannes Film Festival, and and then obviously that's on hold. So I'm not, ex I'm really not sure of uh, what's going to happen with with Rennie's movie at this point. Um, obviously, it'll come out at some point. It's pretty much done. They they uh, they started mixing it last week, I think. So, okay. But it was fun. I really enjoyed it. What's Rennie Harden's film called again? The Misfits. Looking forward to that. And it's great that you reunites with with Rennie Harlan. The first film you did was Deep Blue Sea, am I right? That's correct. That was my first one with him. I, I remember that fondly, a very fun blockbuster. Well, you know what was great about that? Uh, Rennie came in and he said, um, we really need a, 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 you know, everyone says we need a great theme. And um, although that's changed a lot now, it's more about just the atmosphere that, There's not as much theme writing these days from what I've seen in the, uh, sometimes, but not, not always. Um, but um, I said, can I just play you something? And I went, I got a beautiful grand piano and I, I went, we went into my piano room and I played him the whole theme, the main theme of a deep blue sea on the piano. And, and uh, it was amazing. He said, that's it. That's it. Don't change your note. And I said, well, I don't know if I can ever play it exactly as I've played it. I was just kind of playing the piano. And uh, he said, don't change it. So it was <laughs> it's wonderful when that happens. You know, I hadn't done a demo of it or anything. Great, great. He's, he's, a, he's a wonderful guy to work with, Rennie. I'm really one of my favorites, maybe my favorite. Trevor, is there anything else you would like to add about your career up to this point? Anything you would like to share with me and our audience? Well, what I'm doing right now, I've been doing it for a long time. I'm putting together a new album, uh, you know, Trevor Rabin album. Uh, but this time it's not instrumental. It has vocals and uh, I've definitely utilized all the information I've, uh, that I've um, kind of tapped into with working so intensely with orchestra you know before doing film i would do little bits and pieces like on uh, the big generator the yes album i did two or three uh, just uh, like i uh, it was an octet uh, string section uh, you know it, it was four viol uh, four violins 
uh, two violas, cello and bass, and I would just do that. And, and then I would do, for producers, I would do orchestra arrangements for records. I mean, when I was studying orchestration, I would, you know, do some of the symphonies and things, but uh, film has really uh, led me to a great place and creating really my own style with orchestra and so I kind of try and utilize that within this uh, the rock world so it's kind of a new kind of style for me and uh, I'm I'm really excited about it and unfortunately uh, my poor agent I said to him uh, you know when the band got into the rock hall of fame John and Rick said to me you know maybe we should tour and so we, we thought, we'll just do a little to six, seven shows. And it turned into 200 shows over two years. And my agent said, you know, I had like 40 meetings set up for you and you, you're on the road or you're not doing film anymore. I said, no, I am. I just, I'm just on the road right now. And then when that ended, uh, you know, um, I, he started looking around and seeing what's good uh, and would be right for me. And that's when Rennie came up. But now... I really want to focus on this this album, so Great. I'm, um, I'm probably not going to do much other than this album for um, until the end of the year, I think. Looking forward to, to that. Trevor, I would like to thank you so very much for taking so much time out of your busy schedule. I really appreciate that, and I had such a great time talking to you, and I hope you enjoyed the conversation as well. Uh, Michael, it was absolutely fantastic. It was a real joy talking to you.